Hello, this is Stephen Whitfield with Drilling Contractor. Today I'll be joined by George Stutz, currently a contractor of the U.S. Department of Energy's Geothermal Technologies Office, and we'll be talking about geothermal drilling, specifically the lessons he learned in transitioning from the world of oil and gas to the world of geothermal. Mr. Stutz previously gave a presentation on this topic at the IABC Drilling Engineers Committee's Quarter 2 Technology Forum on June 30th. Thank you very much for joining me today. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you for inviting me back. I look forward to uh, speaking with you again. So my first question, uh, we'll touch on this presentation that you gave at the DEC Tech Forum. You focused on the things you wish you knew in transitioning from oil and gas to geothermal. One of those things you mentioned was an underappreciation of high temperatures, particularly the way in which high temperatures in geothermal drilling can affect downhole tools. Can you go more into detail about that? Sure. So over the past year, uh, one of the projects I've been lucky enough to work on is FORGE in Utah, which is the frontier observatory for research in geothermal energy, um, where we're trying to create a real world uh, full size um, EGS system enhanced geothermal system uh, in the subsurface. And um, just to note, anytime I, I mentioned FORGE, all of that data is publicly available on the Geothermal Data Repository or GDR. Um, so if you're interested, um, I urge everyone to go take a look there and kind of dig deeper into uh, uh, what I'm talking about here. Uh, but on that project, the first deviated well, uh, the 16A, uh, the research team did experience some failures. Uh, what we learned was that traditional tools, be it logging, packers, bridge plugs, BHA components, um, not all of them could handle the elevated temperatures and the forces that we were asking them uh, to deal with uh, in the geothermal setting. And so as a result, we did experience some challenges. And what it really revealed, I think, was a, a need to collaborate more effectively um, to understand tool limitations and to optimize the equipment um, as we seek to bring over uh, oil and gas uh, knowledge, people, tools, techniques into the geothermal space. Um, and while we did experience some challenges on those, I do want to point out that there was a lot of success on that well, the 16A. And it actually ended up coming in about 50% 50, uh, 50 of AFE days. Um, so that was a, a great success. And every subsequent well um, that we've done there has uh, built on those successes. Um, in particular, PDC uh, bits brought over from the oil and gas industry, um, completely 100% existing technology, uh, performed extremely well. Uh, those combined with mechanical specific energy and what we call physics-based limiter redesign um, all really helped push the envelope on the rates of penetration that we're able to achieve in granites. Um, looking forward, I think there's still a lot of unlocked value in oil and gas um, tools, techniques, and people. And I think my main point with um, underappreciation of high temperatures was that if you are with, say, an oil and gas service company and you're asked to provide tools to the geothermal industry, uh, make sure and have an open and honest dialogue about uh, your tools, what they're capable of, and really kind of hone in on optimizing everything to kind of prevent those challenges. Um, yeah, overall, I would say um, there's still a great opportunity as we uh, learn and look to the future. Describe the value propositions of geothermal drilling versus oil and gas drilling. You said in the presentation that they were fundamentally different. How is that so? So in my previous presentation, I had an example calculation where uh, I took 12,500 barrels of hot water at 200 degrees C uh, to result in one megawatt electric. And while oil um, varies wildly, us uh, folks in the oil and gas industry know that no two oil fields produce exactly the same thing. But um, for the sake of discussion, 100 barrels a day of oil is probably 5 to 10 megawatts every hour of chemical potential energy. And that's really the fundamental difference is thermal energy in hot brine versus chemical potential in oil and gas. And while I haven't had thermodynamics in over a decade, so feel free to check me on those calculations. But the point is it's several orders of magnitude different in total energy. Uh, in the systems. And as soon as you get that hot brine out of the reservoir, it's actually losing value. It's losing energy uh, to the surroundings. Um, but that's not always the, the whole story, right? If we pair our energy sources more closely to their final consumption, our whole energy infrastructure becomes more efficient. And I started my geothermal career in the deep kind of direct use side. 
And so the classical example that I always bring up is space heating. Um, so in your house, in your office, um, we usually heat to about 25 degrees C, that's, that's about room temperature, but we use natural gas currently and that burns at about 2000 uh, degrees C. And so we don't really need that huge chemical potential energy in that case. And we can probably find a geothermal source that can supply 25 C uh, temperatures very readily in the subsurface. You also spoke about cost conscious decision making in geothermal and how utilizing more modern rigs with enhanced capabilities can allow for more data collection and utilization. What kind of value would that access to that data have for a geothermal drilling project? Yeah, so I'm a drilling engineer originally, uh, started at Chevron and worked several years there. And at Chevron, we used a very uh, probabilistic and data-driven approach um, to our drilling campaigns. And the overall goal there is to reduce the range of outcomes, reduce the variability in time and cost, and then move the whole probability distribution of what your wells are costing to the right or basically lower cost. Um, the primary tool to do that is past wells, right? But in oil and gas, you're drilling tens, hundreds of wells a year. In geothermal, you don't really have that. Um, in the US, on the geothermal side, there's only 10 to 20 wells per year. So any individual geothermal field might only have one or, one or two wells. And so in a discontinuous drilling campaign like that, there's a large loss of what I guess I'll call institutional knowledge, right? You're not using the same rigs, you're not using the same crews. Uh, sometimes, right, the drilling engineer only gets to drill one well a year. Um, so they don't have that knowledge uh, readily available. And so I see data collection, data quality, uh, data retention as a way to bridge that gap. Basically, if we have, you know, great, very detailed daily reports, electronic data uh, recorded, uh, we can kind of pretend that that well that I drilled last year was just last week, uh, similar to an oil and gas uh, setting. So I think, uh, again, access to that high quality data can help serve as a bridge for that lack of institutional knowledge. Well, Mr. Stutz, thank you very much for speaking with us today. Uh, geothermal is a hot topic uh, in the world of drilling these days, and, and companies are obviously looking for sort of the connection between oil and gas and, and geothermal, and it seems like there will be a lot more discussion on this in the near future. So thank you for taking the time to give your insight on this. Yeah, thank you. And thank you very much for visiting Drilling Contractor.